You are being live streamed. Hmm. Turn my phone down or somebody will call me. <laughs> <laughs> you just know it. <laughs> Sentil Nagapan was the first one to log in. Pretty good. He is very quick. Yes. Richard Grace is in run for his money. <laughs> I haven't seen Richard Grace on for a while. Uh, he may be. Well, he finally moved, did, though, didn't he? Maybe he doesn't have internet out there. I don't know. Oh, he did go out way out there. Like way, way out there? I don't, I mean, I'm not sure how far, I'll, I can reach out to him and see, see how he's. Yeah. Okay. Let's check on him. Let's bug him. Huh, I can do that well. Gary knows all about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, luckily we're not in the same time zone. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're funny. I think you're funny. I don't know if I like Gary Palmer anymore. Oh. <laughs> Mike Overacker's on. Good. Now, this image that you see here of the total lunar eclipse, Gary, you took that shot. Do you remember which lunar eclipse that was? Um, it was a long time ago. I'm going to say that was about seven years ago. Holy moly. How could you remember that? Um, because for me to dig it out, it took me ages scrolling down Facebook to find it. <laughs> oh, there you go. Facebook's your, your, your diary, if you know what I mean. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I had somebody the other week ask for a, a picture for a book, and it was exactly uh -huh. the same thing. Scroll down Facebook. It was three years ago, and then I just go to the hard drive and find it. Yeah. Um, but you... The amount of data we get in a year, you just can't keep the video files. You can only keep a couple of really nice objects or really nice things that you do. Yeah. They're, they're just too big now. They're, you know, they're pushing like 50 gig of a video file. Um, all the remote stuff we're putting in in Spain at the moment, um, that's all got computers out there that will process the images so we can get the images back as a stacked image rather than a video file. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's that so remote as having to run on Starlink. So you guys are going to cover image acquisition? Uh... Yeah, if it's clear, if not, I've got the scope on the moon. It's just yeah. that there's clouds in between me and it. Um, but there, there was some gaps over the back there. It's still light here. The sun's sort of set, but it's still um, light over the back. It looked like it might clear for a little bit. So yeah. we'll try it. If not, then we'll just do it off of a camera on the desk and run through the, uh, the right. setting up of the live acquisition. I just shared this to um, Dobsonian astrophotographers. So... If uh, certainly, uh, you know, lunar eclipses, you know, you guys are probably doing 
Dobsonian astrophotography are already doing deep sky work. Yeah. Uh, you know, absolutely, you can do a lunar eclipse with it. No problem. Yeah, it's easy. You, you don't, less is more with the full less, moon. Less is more. That's right. Yeah. You know, a lot of people think, oh, you know, I need like 2,000 frames or I need this or I need that. Yeah. yeah. watching this uh, if you're astrophotographers you got friends that are astrophotographers and you want to get the best lunar eclipse images you know share this on other groups and share this with your friends uh, you know it's very timely to have Gary Palmer on to kind of walk you through it uh, just as, even if you're an expert at this is just to kind of walk through the whole whole sequence again This is Scott Roberts with Explore Scientific and the Explorer Alliance, and you're on, uh, you're watching Focus on Astrophotography with special guest Gary Palmer, with Tyler Bowman, and uh, uh, Tyler, I'll let you uh, introduce Gary for all the people that don't already know him. So, everybody knows who Gary is. He's been around since the Stone Age, but for those that don't know who Gary Palmer is, Gary is. Um, in my opinion, uh, a great solar astrophotographer um, or solar imager. He also does deep sky objects as well, but he's, in my opinion, his, his expertise is in solar. It's all this man does is solar imagery. Um, and today's little, uh, the focus on astrophotography lesson, if you want to call it that, is um, how to capture the moon. Because uh, we got the lunar eclipse coming up. Um, we also have a scott may have to correct me a lunar global star party eclipse is that it scott well they're the right words but it just kind of mixed up uh, yeah Tumblr. so anyways it's going to happen sunday night starting at seven central yeah. we'll have uh, speakers on we'll have uh we'll try to have continuous coverage of uh of the moon as it's going through even before it goes through its uh, major phases and stuff of the eclipse um uh, and running it through, you know, after the eclipse. There's actually going to be a party. We're going to try to have a party right here at Explore Scientific. Uh, so if you're in the area, you like telescopes and stuff, you like all this stuff, uh, swing on by. Doors will be open. Uh, yep. We'll have refreshments and that kind of thing. And showing stuff on the big screen that we have in our conference room. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, we will uh, we'll have special speakers on... Uh, uh, and so any of you watching that want to kind of help out, uh, you still have time to sign up to be a contributor to the uh, Lunar Eclipse uh, global event. So, And I think, Scott, me and Kent have, we've talked about it. I think we're going to bring out the 20-inch daub and look at the moon, obviously. Okay. with And just if anybody wants to stop by, we can literally look at the moon with a 100-degree eyepiece and just be awestruck while it while the lunar eclipse happens right um but that's we'll, we'll talk a little bit we'll make sure everybody's aware of that after the end of the show again sure um but today's focus on astrophotography is lunar photography um same basic principles apply to solar or planetary as well gary you may have to correct me um but that's what gary has is known for again is solar lunar i say some deep sky objects but he can do it he can literally do it all. Um, I don't but know. Gary, I, I really love his deep sky work that he does. Yeah, so. he I does. A master. He is. He really is great at it. Um, so I'm going to let Gary kind of just 
talk who he is, what he does, and let the class begin. Oh, thanks, everyone. Thanks, Scott. Thanks, Tyler. Yeah. Welcome to everybody on the show this evening. Um, we were going to try and capture the moon live tonight. Whether we will be able to do that, I don't know, um, and run through some settings. Um, but I will run through sort of the basics of this. Um, the lunar photography is not hard. It, I think the biggest problem with lunar photography um, is overexposing. If you overexpose on the moon, it's very, very hard to recover the data back. And that's always the issue with it. So that being in, sort of in mind, that's really where we're sort of entering on this. And the other night I was being lazy. Um, well, not really lazy, not paying attention to what I was doing. Um, and that's the key thing. So what I did was I had the scope on the moon, was just doing um, a single video, shot a couple of them, and then thought to myself, ah, oh, I didn't switch the histogram on. And what displays on your screen on a camera or on the actual screen that you're using to capture is not what you're capturing. And that's the big problem. And it works the same with planetary, it works the same with solar. So use of a histogram is really quite important because if you get near the uh, limb of the moon, then you're going to get the issue where some of the, the objects, certainly when it's in phases, um, are brighter. Um, and that will overexpose. And you just cannot recover that. There, there's no magic trick. There's no magic tool in Photoshop or something. You can dim it down a fraction, but it really stands out in the image. Um, Therefore, what we do is we're going to, just going to move some screens around and we're going to look at a capture screen. The camera is set up. The moon might appear while we're actually doing this. Um, it is actually locked on to the moon. We were due to get some clear skies, but it's the UK. So I take that with a pinch of salt. The weathermen are known as Pinocchio here. So um, there we go. Share this screen over. Okay. So this is the remote imaging rig. Um, it's got sharp cap on. It's running a deep sky camera. So we're running uh, the 294 MC. And at the moment, I've just got it on a uh, one second exposure and the gain's quite high. That's just so that we can uh, see whether the moon's gonna appear behind the clouds. One of the sort of first things about this is how you set it up. So let me just put the chat on there. Um, raw rate. Really, if you're not used to doing this, then I would go for raw rate. It's going to speed the camera up. And we're after speed at the end of the day. You don't have to have a mass amount of speed, but you do need to have a certain amount of it there. The capture area. If you're using deep sky cameras, um, and we're going to record a video, it's really, really hard to um, stack a full frame image from a deep sky camera and exactly the same with the DSLR. Where you can play around with the DSLR shots because they're single frames, it's a little bit more awkward if it's in a video. You can resize it in certain software, but you're just making a lot of work. So what we can do is, is use the capture area here yeah, and come down. So we can pick off another square area that's roughly half the size. You're also going to notice now that your, your frame rate will start to go up and different things like that. So as we're moving down, we would then select the output format, normally SER. That means you're not um, struggling with any sizing on the cameras or, or any um, on the image file. Sorry, you're not struggling with the sizes. AVI is a reduced format anyway, and it only runs to about three and a half gig. So they say just over four but um, lots of computers will start playing around. You can also find buffering in the software. You'll start to see a, an area down here where you get drop frames. Um, and that could be because you've got it in the wrong file format. We never use um, really FITs or PNG files or TIFF files, anything like that. Any planetary imaging, solar or lunar is generally done with SER files on a deep sky camera. Then if we're coming down, uh, one of the biggest problems with a lot of the cameras at the moment, this is an aesthetic thing. It's to make it look nice on the screen. They put the blue 
up at 92 when you first switch cameras on. Um, and the only reason for that is is because of imaging the moon, they want it to look bluey gray. But that messes around with the colors. If you want to extract colors later, it causes problems. And it can also cause problems in deep sky images. So it's a really good idea to run this back down and have the uh, white balance on the red and the blue the same. Run them at 52 on each. If you've got a cooler, switch it on. Um, always helps with the camera and the noise. Now this is the pro version of Sharp Cap, so it does have the histogram. Whenever we're doing uh, planetary imaging, um, some people go, oh, well, you know, our uh, images are really, really noisy. And that's because they've got the automatic brightness switched on. And that's going to give you a false representation on everything. So you must make sure that's switched off. Once that's done, really the next thing is setting up. So um, if we had the moon in view there, we would be focusing to get the moon into focus. And do zoom in. Use the zoom up the top here. Run it in at 75 or 100%. So you zoom right into the image and really get a sharp focus. If you don't get a sharp focus, you, um, it, really your images are a waste of time. So that's quite important. Once you've got the focus done, bring that back down to also. Then we can start looking at our exposure. What we're interested in on the histogram, and I'm going to put the histogram back down the bottom here. We're interested in the white. We're not interested in the other colors on the histogram bar. Because the camera's got two green pixels, it's always going to be brighter in the green. So it can give you a false reading. So we're after the, the white value on this. I really want your white value on anything lunar or solar somewhere around the 60 to 70. That's going to give you a nice image. It's not going to be overexposed. And it's going to be sort of fairly straightforward on everything. When you're ready to capture, it's really down to you. Now, on the deep sky cameras, they're large format cameras. Most of them are 20 MP cameras, something like that. You don't need thousands and thousands of frames. All you need for a lunar is somewhere around 200, 500. If you've got a really slow um, camera and you've got a slow computer, even 100 frames will do. You can stack 20 of those and get a really nice image. And away you go, once you want to capture, yeah, is just go to quick capture and select that amount of frames. And that's it, really. That, that is the, the capture process. If you want to zoom in a bit more, you can use the ROI again. So you could drop down the ROI if you wanted to go in for set sort of craters. You could use this camera and drop right down to sort of uh, 1280 by 1024. Um, or even the 1920 uh, by 1200 is quite good. That can give you some nice detail. So you can use, they're quite versatile to be used on this, but you're never going to get masses amount of frames. So if we actually drop the exposure rate down to somewhere around where it would be, so it's going to be about eight milliseconds roughly. I'll bring the game back down. And you'll watch the frame rate there. You've got about 25 frames a second. Yeah, so that's not overly bad for one of these cameras. If you switch these into 16 bit, you're going to get a nicer image. So go raw 16. Um, that will depend on whether your computer can handle it. All you'll see is a marginal frame drop, just a very slight amount there. So that's really the sort of capture software and, and where we go with that side of things. For the actual images themselves, I'm just going to shut this piece of software down for a minute. Um, there's a couple of different things you can do. Now, we talked about mosaics the other night, and I know there were a few questions people asking about um, Microsoft Ice. Microsoft Ice is a simple piece of software to use for mosaicing. Um, and when we mean mosaicing, we mean going across the moon and taking a more high resolution image. So if I go into one of the folders here, let's go to something like that. These are all of the single images that create the whole moon. And that just means any one of them is a lot higher resolution um, than a whole uh, moon in, in the uh, field of view. So we can put these straight into ICE and create a mosaic. It's quite a good program for doing this. But really, once you start getting over this amount of images, you're going to get all sorts of problems. 
So you can select all the images and just drag and drop them into ICE. It's not a program that's uh, available from Microsoft anymore. It's um, you'll find it on some of the download repositories here and there. Um, that's how I picked out today. And there's only a couple of versions around. And you see, as soon as you put them in, it's already done this. But once you get over a certain amount of frames, then you're going to get issues with this where it will start um, not matching them around the edges. And also you can get problems with the background. And this is one of the reasons why I don't really use it overly much, but you can zoom in. Um, it's a good idea to sort of move around on the image and check that the edge is aligned because that's normally where the problem comes. But once you're happy with that, um, you can do the automatic prop on it. It will set that up so you see it move all the lines in and then you just um, export it out to whatever um, format you want. And that's it. It's literally that simple. Just going to discard that for a minute because I already did it earlier just to save a bit of time. So that's the image there. Um, now you've got to sort of play around and do a little bit of um, color, uh, really calibration on it and, and sorting things out. If you look at this, it was a daytime shot. You can see that the background there is sort of quite blue. Yeah. Um, it, but it doesn't sort of show up that well. Um, but it was a daytime main shot on that particular one. So looking at um, other things that we can do, if we look at uh, stacking images in auto stacker. So if we wanted to stack these images up or we wanted to stack up one of the full frame uh, images. So something like this, this was a couple of nights back. Um, seeing wasn't great. You can see there is just very slightly overexposed on the leading edge there. So, but we use that one. Um, so if we open up Auto Stacker, if it's not good seeing, try and use Auto Stacker 2 over 3. It just stabilizes a little bit better. And then we drag and drop into the image. Now you notice straight away the biomatrix is off. Yeah, so once we go into this, yeah, set up the Auto Detect, and then it's gone back to the natural color. If you press Control, try and get your alignment box over the a big chunk of the image. So if we look here, you see on this, we recorded a thousand frames. Didn't really need that many, but it was a bit wobbly. So as you can see there. And what we're gonna do is scroll the frame slider across. And if you actually look at that crater just in there, you'll see then that as I went over that, it brightened up. That means it's a fairly good focus in that central area. Come over to the uh, control panel and we're going to do improve tracking, select on global for the alignment points. And the noise robust wants to be set quite high. It's big features, yeah, craters and different things like that. And we're going to analyze it. That'll take a couple of seconds to analyze up. It's quite a big file that's come off of that camera. Now, Gary, what I don't know if you, you mentioned this, what when you're doing either solar or planetary, is there a specific camera that you use? Do you mainly do one shot color? Do you do it, monochrome? It, I, I just really whatever I've got laying around. Sometimes we're, just because the deep sky cameras are on a rig and that's in an observatory, mm -hmm. we know it's not going to be clear for long. Then that's the one that we use. You know, we just fire it up and take some shots. And that was literally this. So this has even got the reducer on, which is not ideal. In the real world, you would use the, the scope natively without any reducer on, unless you're struggling to fit it in the field of view. Yeah, so if you've only got a larger aperture telescope, then a reducer might help you fit the whole moon in the field of view. So that's done. Um, next thing we need to do is open up Registax. You don't have to use Registax. Um, it's just it's free. Yeah, that that's the the uh, main thing with it. It's quite old now. Uh, use Registax 6 if you can. Registax 5 is quite hard work. And the reason we open that up is just that this will go straight into that software in a minute once it's finished. And if you want to be able to do that, open up the more file options and you'll see a little checkbox there to send it over to Registax afterwards. So 
Once we've done that, we've got to look at the amount of APs. Now, full frame cameras um, um, or APC cameras, um, you don't want your um, alignment point size very small. It's just going to overload your computer. It's going to make it really, really hard work. Um, so you're better off getting hold of this, um, putting it up, click on 200, and then click the up arrow, and just run it up to three or 400, somewhere around there, and then place the APs on the grid. Once that's done, we've got to set the amount. So we're going to stack 20% of these. We try it at that. If it's not that good, then we try 10%. So you have to play around a little bit sometimes. And we're stacked. Gary, how long did it take you to, to finally, would you, would you say master these developing or processing sites? Because every once in a while, I still struggle. I think what it is, is you strive to do better. Maybe. And that, and that can be the same with equipment. You know, there's scopes that I regret getting rid of, um, <laughs> you know, because you don't actually really realize how good they were, you know, at a set point in time. Yeah. Um, and that's the same with software. I think you can keep playing around with it. And the biggest problem is people over-process things. And they get target fixation on the screen. Yeah. Target fixation, that's a big problem then. So if we open up Registax now, there's our lunar image in, we're opening up full screen. And if we click on the tab there, show full image, just make sure every now and then um, auto stacker does have a meltdown. Um, certainly if you've been putting a few smaller images in, a few images of craters in there, and then processing a full image, it will come out with half a moon or something. So do check that you've got the whole image come over. Otherwise, you might have to um, reprocess it again. We're going to open it back up. Yep. Yeah. And then we're just going to stay on um, the initial layer of one. I generally have it on linear for all and default for all. The Gaussians and that, you can use those if you've got a lot of noise. But in general, I try and keep the gain down quite a bit on the camera. So... If we get hold of slider two, just slide it along somewhere about 30. Anywhere around there I do. So that's too much. You can see straight away it's already. So we're going to bring the histogram up. It's going to come up on my other screen because I was using it there. And we're just going to brighten it up. Bring it out to about 130, something like that on the histogram. And the histogram in Registax is actually really good because it brightens an image linear across it and it's a good way of bringing out the terminator line in images and what i mean by the terminator line is the shadow line that runs down and it's a really good way so you can see here we've really over processed that we've overcooked it straight away and that's because we've got the white line down the edge yeah and the craters have just got too much detail in them so that probably wants to be somewhere around 18 somewhere around there 18 to 20 go somewhere about there if you click on do all as it's running across keep an eye on that line around the outside i said to you this one was touch and go it's a, just a tiny bit overexposed there you can still see the line at the bottom so it still needs to come back a bit more so we come back to about 15. if you want to uh, highlight an area just double tap on the screen and so there you can see the lines more or less disappearing now. So while you might have thought, well, that was giving me a lot more detail there, it's actually destroying another part of the moon. And you would be better getting that detail back with sharpening or some other process later. Mm -hmm. All of the lunar shots are processed in, in the same way, um, whether they're close-up shots or whether they're um, full, full dish shots like this. So it's exactly the same process. Now you can do your color calibration here. So you can play around with your color calibration in here. You could ask it to RGB balance and do an auto balance. And then if we go like that, go do all again, you'll find it give you more or less the correct coloring. What you're gonna find really hard is the saturation from this point onwards to draw out any more colors. Um, you can do it. Um, you can see the color there. Yeah, we can see that it's colored, see some blues and reds in there. Um, but it's just going to be a little bit more awkward. 
And that's all it is. So once this is done, I normally save this. Um, and then you would go into Photoshop and just do a little bit of sharpening, something like that. But a few years back, I looked at some processes in PixInsight, for instance. So PixInsight's a lot more powerful than Photoshop. So another full disk shot, yeah, um, fairly straightforward. So we can zoom into it a little bit. And you notice with this one, it's actually brought in before any sharpening is done. So we're actually going to do the sharpening in Pix Insight rather than using Registax. First thing we've got to do though is get rid of the green color. Yeah, that's always horrible on Luna Shot. So if we look at the top here, we've got two battery buttons, the one on the right, click on that and it's going to separate the colors and you're going to see how dark the blue is when we move these over. So there's a big difference between the three. You can see the two pixels on the green. So we need to balance these up. And the easiest way of doing that is linear fit. So if you open up linear fit. Now, on Sunday, the moon's going to be red. So we want a linear fit against the red channel. Yeah. But on this particular shot, it's just a standard moon shot. So the brightest color there is going to be the green and we want to linear, use the green as the reference. So you look at the ends of the names here, and it's got the G or the R or the B on the end of it. So in the reference image, we're just going to select on there, and we're going to select the green one. And then we're just going to apply it to the blue. And then we're apply it to the red. And what that's doing now is, is that's balancing all of the colors the same. So it's making it an even image. And that's it. Now all we need to do is put the channels back together again. So if we go back into the processes and go to channel combination, fairly straightforward. You'll just go for the R, G, and B corresponding with the uh, letter on the end. Okay, so if we now look at this image, looks very bland, it looks like mono image. It's not though. That's because the colors are all together. So what we can now do, we just shrink these out of the way. So never um, get rid of anything until you're happy with it. Never close it, just shrink them out of the way if they're in the way of anything. What we want to do is, is bring up the curves transformation, which is just like the curves in any other program. There we go. As soon as you tap on the image, the border goes blue. That means it's active. And we want to put up the little circle, the live preview here. Always leave an edge of your image in the background there. Um, that means that when you apply the process, you can just drop it on there and still see what's going on in the, the live preview. Now, what we need is the saturation, which is the S on the end. The borders will go um, purple. Where the first four boxes join, then we're going to lift them up somewhere around there. Go a little bit more. Remember, this is not sharpened yet, so it's going to look quite dull. And then we're going to apply that, drag and drop the triangle on, reset it using the X down in the bottom right, and then just go up about halfway. Don't go too mad. If you go too mad, you'll start to find all your craters up the top there have gone like red. It's not until you zoom into the image that you'll notice this. But it's very tempting to really draw out a lot more color on this. Yeah, and you don't need to. So somewhere around there, pull the uh, top line a little bit flatter. Apply that so you could keep going with this. This one's actually got quite good color calibration on the whole image. Um, what we're going to do is close the live preview and we're going to settle with that for the minute. Now what we're going to do, reset it, go back to the RGBK values, which is basically the whole image. Yeah, put the live preview up again. We're just going to give it a little boost. Not a lot, just a tiny little bit.
Now, the next thing we need to do is sharpen it. There's a couple of different ways of doing this. Um, Pix Insight has got a, a, a wavelets system in it, and the true wavelets. You can um, set it up as linear or dyadic, whichever. It's a case of playing around. It's your taste and your choice at this point. All I can stress is don't go mad. Keep an eye on, and one of the reasons for brightening that up is keeping an eye on that edge line. Yeah, so now what we do, put up the live preview again, click the circle. And then what we're gonna do is, is we're gonna get uh, layer two and we're just gonna slide up the bias here very, very gently, a little bit at a time, something like that. Even that's a bit too much. And then we're gonna apply that to the image. And that's it. There's your color shot of the moon. If you wanna go into Photoshop with it now and change the tones of the colors around a little bit. So there's a little bit of pinky red there that I'd probably take out in Photoshop. Now, the other day I did say about overlaying images. So if we go into Photoshop, I put a couple of images in there. Want something else. Right, that one there and that one there. So if you want to overlay images, um, you can bring in all sorts of different stuff. Let me just go into one of the folders. I think it was. When you have too much hard drive space, you don't uh, remember where stuff is. <laughs> wasn't that? I moved a few bits around earlier because I know that we had one of these. Yeah, what it was was I put it in um, Pix Inside. So let's just use the sharpened version for a minute. Um, let me just save that image out of Pix Insight. That's going to be easier. Uh, right, wait, there. Do, 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 do. I think these are slightly different phases. I did have two phases together a minute ago. That was the uh, thing and I moved one of them. So we're gonna go in here. It's got a feeling that these are the same phase. Let's just take that one. If anybody in the audience has any questions for Gary, like how, um, you know, what he does to get to this point, because Gary does offer classes uh, through Explore Scientific. It's his mentorship. Uh, program that we have. Um, I was going to see if Scott could find that link and plug it into the YouTube chat. Um, that way, if you if you want some more one on one time, because Gary, this is just an hour show, and Gary has multiple multiple hours of knowledge <laughs> stuck in that head of his, and he will literally make your head hurt with all of it. Um, because I've done some classes with Gary, which actually I just signed up for some more for just solar imagery because i just picked up a cork and <clears throat> it's going to be very entertaining for me he's going to get a lot of laughs because of it <laughs> so if you have okay. any questions that you want to ask gary don't hesitate to ask i mean that's why we're here we're here to help uh, if you guys are struggling with something you know what's what can we do to help you um so pekka hautula he says, and Pix and, is Pix and Sight worth to pay for solar and moon imaging processing, Gary? I, I do quite a lot in it. Yeah, it, it's got a lot of powerful tools when you want to manipulate things around. Um, just going to remove the green off of this just so we can see what we're doing. So if we go in there, there's lots of different tools for different programs and different ways of doing it. Yeah. It's a little bit red there. I'm not overly worried. This is more a point of showing you if you've got a mono shot, how to overlay it over the um, over the top of your color image. And that actually could be very, very similar to what you might be getting on Sunday night. Yeah, it will be quite dark. It'd be quite dull until you've played around with the coloring. 
Um, we could go into color balance and just give it a little bit of a red kick. Yeah, just to sort of push it over a little bit to more what it'll be like. We'll just do something like that. Okay, the other image that's here, that one there, we're gonna select all of this image, yeah? So select all, and then we're gonna copy it. And then we're gonna bring it back in to this image here. I'm gonna post it over the top. Don't worry about the sizing. If you've got different sizes where you've done mosaics or anything like that, what you need to do now is go to the layers and the layer that we've pasted in there, we need to open up you know, your selection box above it and turn it to luminosity so that we can see the full image. And also you might wanna turn down the opacity on this a little bit. Yeah, just so you can start to see what's going on with it. So at the moment, we're just after getting the outer sizing correct. So if you go to the edit menu with that layer selected, and then we want to go to free transform. Yeah, and we're going to increase the size. This does take a little bit of time. This is not a five minute thing. What you can do is grab hold of the handles here and start to rotate as you're increasing the size so that you're starting to line it up correctly. You yeah. see the mirrors there, a bit more rotation. So you can also see it, um, but you can play around with this to your heart's content and overlay this over the top. Uh, Gary, there is a question for you. Uh, yep. Can you stack lunar or planetary images in PixInsight, which I believe you can? You can, but it's quite hard work. Yeah, yeah. I, I would be coming outside of that. I would be using something like PIP, um, PIPP, for, certainly for getting uh, CR2 files from like a, a DSLR together um, and things like that. So what we're doing here is, is we're looking for the craters, so you can come off of this. You can just click on the, the tick button and then we can zoom into it a little bit if we want. See how we're going. The idea is, is you, so you can see the top of the crater there. Yeah. And we can use the move tool. We can start moving that crater on top of the other one. There we go. So we've got a bit more stretching to do. If you double click the hand and then we can go back into free transform again. I said it's a little bit of playing around to do this, but it does give a, a really good result afterwards because the, the mono camera is going to give you a lot nicer image. A uh, couple more questions for you, Gary. Uh, Synthol Nagapan wants to know, does Photoshop help in lunar and solar stacking? Not really. Not in the stacking. There, there are old-fashioned ways of doing the, the stacking in... Um, in Photoshop, uh, but it, it's really not a process that's done much these days. Yeah, and one more question. Um, Pekka Hautala is wanting to know, if he sends you a moon capture file, uh, could you possibly process it in PixInsight so he can see what the differences are between his software well, and your it, software? Yeah, I mean, I would be do, still doing the stacking, very similar to what I did. Yeah. So that's not 100% aligned. I'll tell you now, you'd have to spend a good 20 minutes doing this and getting this, but yeah, to bring the opacity up now. Yep. Because the you're, you're trying to line each minute crater, and it's yeah, that's it's not easy. It's just a little bit out of the bottom there. But you can see now, if I just go like that, we're going to recenter the image. Yeah. Don't worry about the background, you'll soon get the background, but really, to be honest, we want to crop that anyway. But what I'm looking at here is, is if you play around with the opacity now, you can get a really nice balance. If I switch that layer off and we go back to the layer behind, you can see the difference. Yeah. So by doing that, you bring out a lot more. It's just a little bit out on these mirrors here, just to leave a little bit more rotation on it. Um, but it is something you would spend a good little bit of time doing to line these up. Once you've got that done, um, then you can sharpen this up, you can contrast it. So if we just right click on that, just for the exercise here, 
Um, we're going to flatten the image and we're going to crop it. Another question for you, Gary, while you're fiddling around. Do you use darks and flats with lunar imaging? Um, only if I've got a lot of dust on the sensor. Otherwise, I don't worry about it. Yeah. Um, some sensors will give you a, a, a hatch pattern. Yeah. Uh, get that hatch pattern, then, yeah, take a live flat and, and you can reduce it. So you can see there, you, you play around. It's a little bit off at the top, a little bit off at the bottom. But you can see how much detail and color change it's bringing out just by using the mono overlay over the top of it. Correct. The image that you had on the intro was done exactly the same way. That was using that um, mono over the top of the fully clips. Okay. And then just go in and play around with some things like contrast. So put it into legacy mode, contrast it up, and really do whatever you want. Play around to your heart's content. And that's the thing, folks, is I'm telling you, Gary has so much information. He, I don't know, I think you might, you might give Warren Keller a run for his money, too. <laughs> he gets, uh, he gets, gets better skies. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. That's, that's the other thing is he if gets get better the, skies. If you get the data, you know. Yeah. Uh, and, and I think that's the same with anything. If you get nice, clean data doesn't matter whether it's lunar, solar, planetary, deep sky, whatever. It's half the amount of work. Yeah, know? it really is. You know, because you're forever trying to remove things like halos that cause yep. by the cloud or you're trying to, you know, repair color on something because something else has happened. So having the, the, the real clear skies really does help. Um, but it's having a good, clean setup. I mean, because I've started to... I always, when I started out, I always took apart all my gear and then yeah. put it up. Now I, everything is together. I literally just take the telescope, throw it on the mountain, I'm done. I don't have a dome or anything yet. Um, so if I know that I'm going to leave it as a complete unit, I don't take it apart ever. Because I know once I do, I'm going to bring in dust. I'm going to bring in so much more stuff that I'm going to have to take new flats. And it's just a pain in the butt. It really is. And it just makes processing that much longer in my opinion. For, for people in the industry, as you know, I do a lot of testing on equipment. We've got equipment coming in and out all the time. Yeah. It does get a bit of a chore sometimes, keep changing it around because you know that you've got to reset everything up. Exactly. New flats, new this, new darks, everything with a, a new filter set or a new camera um, or change a telescope. So it can get sort of quite tedious. The mount I generally leave alone you know what I mean? It's last resort to take the mount out and change that over for something. Yep. Yep. We've got temp temporary areas that we put in stuff that's on um, review or we're testing or something like that. So, but yeah, it, it does. And, you know, when people strip stuff down, it's a good idea to try and leave the camera on if at all possible. Correct. If you, you have got to strip it down and bring it in the house, leave the camera on. Yeah, because it, it, it saves you realigning it. If you're using flat, uh, having to take flats or other things like that, so you redoing them. Um, there's 101 reasons for um, trying to make life easy. And not um, having to take flats every time you go out is easy. <laughs> yeah, and, and, you know, different systems. I mean, if we've got the big scopes, you know, taking flats on those is a bit of a pain. Yeah. Um, you know, getting it all set up and doing everything. So... Yeah, but, you know, there's lots of ways around it. I mean, like, I just use one of these cheap panels. Yeah. I even used the cover it came in. Yeah, it's like £17 on Amazon or something like that. It's got a little touch button here, and you just touch it, and it brightens up. And for the big telescopes, we just use one of these. It's a fraction of the price of some of the panels that are out there at the moment. Yeah. Um, and that goes right up to, you know, 12-inch. So that's how I deal. Um, but if I need flats, then I'll do them on that. Um, and that's the same on the planetary. <coughs> Some cameras, I swear the manufacturer does this as a joke, that they actually electrostatically charge the front glass. Yeah? yeah. Because whatever you do, you are not getting that dust off that camera. Yeah. No. You can use acetone. You can use anything you want on there. 
that is not coming off. Yeah. yeah. I do highly suggest that you don't. Acetone is not too bad on a, a sensor, but don't put it on the front glass because if you've got oh. uh, AR coatings or um, UV coatings on them, it, it just <laughs> clean them straight off. I've even done that with lens wipes. Yeah. You know, just like standard lens wipe. Yeah, that would take the coating off if you're not not careful. So, but some of them are a real pain, and there's no easy way. The the only way to do it is with a um, cotton bud, and mm -hmm. to actually breathe on the camera. You, your yeah. breath is um, condensated air. Yeah, so it's the, the cleanest air, and that's quite a good way of actually cleaning eyepieces out in the field. Breathe on uh, them. Yeah. No. And or I get one of those. Uh, like a DSLR puffer ball. And yeah, just, I've got the big ones. Yeah. These uh, Giotto ones, these work. Yeah, those they, work. Uh, they've got a bit of guts in them um, to blow the dust around. But there are certain cameras that you just can't get it off. It, it does not matter what you do, so flats are your only way forwards for that. <laughs> Norm Hughes says just spit on it and rub it with your finger and shirt. <laughs> <laughs> I guess. I mean, it works. I it's have a work. pad. I have... <laughs> Um, I can remember some of the Luminera cameras a few years back. They were really bad. And they were yeah. big cameras. You know, they, they, they're not, um, you know, a $200 camera. They're a $2,000 camera. Um, <laughs> and they were the same. They, you just could not get the dust off. And in the end, you just pulled the front glass off them. You just don't unscrew it or take the front glass off. And the sensor was way easier to clean. But yeah. a lot of people who are just night imaging don't get so many problems. If you're solar imaging... You get the dust from the daytime and the dust yeah. gets over all of your equipment. So you've got to be quite careful with how you clean it because you might actually be scratching it with sand. So there is one question. I'm going to try my best to make it out. Uh, Pekka says that when the craters are in fine details on the moon surface, mm -hmm. it seemed to be too small amount of doublets is it the fault of the stacking process or too many alignment points on the auto stacker? Not sure what he means by the doublets. I'm not either. I, I'm assuming if he's trying to. It, it might just be over sharpening. Most of the problems are over sharpening of the crater. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, you've got to be really, really gentle with it and really fine. Um, yeah. Do bear in mind that if you use Registax, Registax is years old now. I mean, yeah, you're talking like probably, I don't know, 10 years for Registax 6, something like that. So it can't render very well on the screen. And certain settings that you will adjust make it yeah. look like it's put lines through it. It hasn't. Yeah. yeah. When you save the image out, those lines are not there. Okay. Okay. If now... Take just one other one. If you can't take a flat with your system and you get that hatching off of the camera, so you get like a crisscross hatching on the background, try and get it in a copy of Photoshop. And there are free versions of Photoshop around. Remember CS2, yeah, they stopped any work on. So there's a free license for CS2 around. Just yeah. search for uh, Photoshop CS2 and you'll find the free license and the, the, the free code for it. Um, okay. But try and get it into Photoshop and despeckle it, and that will remove that hatching. Okay. Um, so we got the lunar eclipse coming up. Uh, one, a couple more questions is, would you ever use a filter shooting the moon? Um, yeah, you, I would you, suggest an L Pro, but yeah, that's just me. Yeah, but you can find that distorts the color. So if you're after a really nice coloring, some of these yep. filters have got an edge. Certainly if you've got a mono camera, I use a red filter. Okay. Red filter stabilizes the atmosphere. Um, you can even use a HA filter, but it just make it a little bit darker. Yep. It will stabilize the air a lot more. Um, as for filters in front of color cameras, I'm not a great fan of them because I like the color. That's the yep. point in the color camera. Um, yep. And you're going to distort that. So you might find that a lot of the craters start going really red or um, you get real patches of like a light cyan. Um, on the moon, and that's created by the filter itself. Okay, that makes total sense to me. I mean, uh, the, the moon emits in, in all sorts of different wavelengths. So, remember, years ago, I imaged the moon in calcium K just for the fun of it. It's a bright object just to see what would come off of it. And there's quite a lot of detail that comes off in calcium. So, um, but it's more the effects the filter has 
uh, on your actual camera. Okay. But you must also remember when you're looking at the moon, the moon is a bright object. It's a big mirror. Yeah. yeah? Just a mirror for the sun. So, uh, yeah. um, you know, if you're putting up telescopes and that, remember to use a filter on it just to tone it down for visual. Yeah, because certainly if there's young kids looking through there, it can be pretty bright um, once it's up on full moon. Okay, yeah. I'm going to have to do, I guess I'll use a... In the eclipse, it's not too bad, but certainly yeah. before or after, um, you might want some form of filter on there, depending on the aperture of the telescope. So uh, the red filter that you mentioned, is it just a standard red filter that you yeah, can get I, um, anywhere? I, the, the other night, when I did that uh, mosaic on the star party, that was done with just a Antlia Pro red filter. And uh, do you know the band pass of that particular use, one? You know the real cheap planetary sets that have got the little red filter in? Yeah. Yeah. You, you know, you get like a dozen filters in there for $40 or whatever. Yeah, they're yeah. just real cheap filters. The red one out of them will still stabilize it. Okay. Yeah. Um, it doesn't have to be a really expensive filter in front of it. What you're after. So a lot of people jump straight away to what we call a planetary and IR planetary filter. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but you lose a lot of detail with that. If you're not careful, it's actually taking away detail. It might well stabilize the air because it narrows the bandwidth that's coming through. But it does cause issues that then you're missing data. So that's really what we're looking at at the end of the day. So you would just recommend a standard. Oh, let's see if I got one up here. Just a standard red filter, right? So in like a Optolong red CCD two inch filter, because that's what I got. Um, I don't know if the specs are in here because it's in a filter drawer at the moment. So you could use with the, just with the color camera. You're just going to have to play around a little bit. Yeah. yeah, I mean, that's where you're going to have to play around with the game. You, the you've got a couple of nights. If it's clear, get out there and play around with a few things. Yeah. You know, what you're after at the end of the day is retaining the color in the process afterwards. Correct. Yeah, that is the key thing. So if you go too far, yeah, um, where you color change on a color camera, Can't then there will be a problem. Remember, most color cameras have got an AR and a UVIR coating on them already. Yeah. So if you start playing with that, you could actually get reflections back if you're not careful. Okay. Um, if it's really, really bad scene, you can use uh, Optolong L Pro. I've used one, uh, L Extreme, sorry, or the um, L Enhance. I've used those before. They still allow, the Enhance will still allow the color through, but the red side of it will stabilize the air. Interesting. Hmm. I learned There's something. There's a multitude today. of things because when we set filter wheels up here, yeah. we put a multitude of filters in, yeah, for different uh, scenarios so that we're not taking the stuff out. So the one out there at the moment, it's got, um, it's got a Antlia dual band, it's got the Octolong uh, yeah. stream in, it's got a luminance filter in, you know what I mean? So it's got all sorts of different things and then you can just point it at something and play around, but there's nothing yeah. wrong loading a filter wheel up even in front of a dslr and just seeing what it does and it's having true. it fly around you can find that it stabilizes a camera down on a certain filter but do expect a bit more playing around to get your color back afterwards i mean that's the beauty part about astrophotography is you're it's a constant experiment it yeah. really is you are changing some dynamic to get a certain shot a certain way either messing with your gain, your histogram, your ISO, whichever. It's a, it's a constant experiment. And that's what I, I like about it. it. It actually, it challenges me um, yeah. a lot. And, and that's why I'm glad that there's people like you, Gary, I <laughs> can help kind of guide you in the direction. Yeah, I don't, you know, there's always the point that somebody wants to, you know, kick the mount over and walk away. It, get, it can get that frustrating. It, it definitely can. It definitely you know, can, um, but I don't recommend it. <laughs> no, but I'm just saying that the level of frustration that can be there yeah. at some point with something. Yeah. And one of the reasons for learning things in a little bit of a uniform order is so that you recognize when something's going wrong or you yeah. know you, you can trace back your steps. And a lot of this is fault finding in a sense when something goes wrong. It really um, is. But it, I, from me being in customer service, sometimes it's, it's relieving to help the person that's struggled for so long. 
Yeah. And they just they're they're getting to the point where they're fixed to kick them yeah. out. And Sometimes you give them- it can be nothing that they're doing. It's actually down to a piece of software that they're using. Yeah. Sometimes yeah. it can be. And sometimes it's the yeah. latter. Who's been um, renewed for that over the years? If you use the automatic tool on it, it can yeah. create all sorts of problems when it estimates everything. And you know, you, you got people pulling their hair out. Um, yeah. <laughs> but at the end of the day, if you, you sort of reload it up and ignore the automatic thing and put in your own parameters, you yeah. generally find it settles down. But right. in the beginning, you don't know that. You think anything that can help you, you yeah. you're gonna you're gonna go with. Exactly. Um, and then you you know you got the man going all over the place and stars you know elongated and everything else and that is just down to the software it's just the way it goes um, it's not something that you're doing wrong but it can get really frustrating when you're trying to do something in this I, that's why they make liquor yeah <laughs> but uh, you know, I think one of your most important things on all of this as well is remember that your focus goes out. If you bring your telescopes out, so if I took one of these telescopes out yeah. from the building, it's going to need a good hour to acclimatize. Yeah. It's going to be wobbly when you're looking at it if you don't do that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's that's and, why kind of my yeah. stuff stays out in the shed, so it stays acclimated with the outside, but there's yeah. constant air circulation in here, so it's not just stagnant air that develops into humidity and it sits on the lenses. That's uh, it. And what you're after as well is is sort of thinking that that focus is going to change as the temperature changes. Yeah. yeah. So, um, you know, certainly if you're doing things remotely or whatever, there's a good chance you're going to need to refocus something. Oh, yeah. hundred percent. Um, but, Gary, I really do appreciate you taking your time out of your busy schedule because I know it's always busy. Uh, again, guys, if in the audience that that – Want a little bit more one-on-one time. Maybe you're struggling with your equipment. Um, you know, sometimes it, it, it's kicked me in the butt. I mean, Scott can even tell you I've almost pulled my hair out with his mount behind him because I can't get it to communicate. <laughs> and then he just yeah, comes over there. to get all that hair out of the carpet, you know. <laughs> so there's not you're much left. Young and it grows back fast, so. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, if you're really struggling, if, if it's a, a software, computer, uh, telescope mount or anything. I'm telling you, Gary Palmer is the guy to go to. He's been doing this for years and this is all he does. He's the troubleshoot king, in my opinion. He's helped me help customers figure out issues that I can't figure out. And he literally just rattles off answers like it's nothing. And every time he does it, he laughs at me. <laughs> every time. Every time. So that's that's the banter between me and Gary, but Gary, again, I appreciate you stopping by. Um, guys, don't forget this Sunday is the lunar eclipse. We're going to have a lunar global star party on Sunday at explore scientific. I'm going to set my stuff up here, jump into the zoom session, and then I have to go run to work at explore scientific to help Scott set his up and get everything up and running for him. Cause that's what I do is I do astrophotography <laughs> and I help Scott. Uh, but that's what we're going to have a live event on a Sunday at six o'clock central standard time, Scott. Uh, it's going to start at seven, seven, seven o'clock. No, and, I, had, um, I was on a roll. So, uh, yeah, that's, um, that, uh, but, uh, you know, and then, then more of the eclipse action happens as it get, gets later and later up until about, uh, what, 1030 our time, something like yeah. that, where it starts to get into, uh, full eclipse yep. and, um, Mike Overhacker says, there's going to be a lunar eclipse, question mark, question mark. <laughs> yes, Mike, oh. come on, man. <laughs> what? News. <laughs> Anyways, uh, no, but we're going to have a big party here, or we hope it's a big party. It is I'm a coming. school night, though. It's all right. Right? I mean, it's okay. so kids don't need right. to go to school if there's What's eclipse, school? right? Look at me. Look at me. I Look at that Adam okay. eclipse is school. As far yeah, as you I'm could. So, it could be for school. It could be for school. It should, should be extra credit. Exactly. Right? Exactly. Wow. So we're going to be Anyways. taking pictures with Scott's rig. It's going to be constant live views, guys. We're going to have people from all over that can see it um, do jump in for live views from yeah. wherever they're located. So exactly. it's going to be awesome. It's going to be educational. Of course, it's always that's what we do here at Explore Scientific. We educate and teach about the night sky 
But I think that's going to be today's show, Scott. So I'm going to let you do your normal thing. Okay. Gary, again, I appreciate you stopping in and okay. taking the time to help us understand how to do things. Always good fun. Oh, yeah. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you. Okay. So uh, let's see. Uh, I do also want to mention that we have coming up still this afternoon more um, uh, more uh, programming because it is the 17th Astronomical League live program with and the the um, uh, the highlight of the program actually a couple of highlights will be uh, you know you're going to see David Levy on there you're going to uh, see the keynote speaker which is her name is Jessica. Dr. Jessica, let me make sure I get the name right, Noviello, Noviello, and she is a postdoc at Goddard Space Flight Center. Uh, she is an expert on uh, Europa's surface and uh, geology, geophysics, and her talk today is going to be about cryptovolcanism, okay? Uh, not crypto, but uh, cryo. <laughs> crypto is those Bitcoin things, right? So cryo, that's the ice volcanoes that are in those uh, those moons out there and uh, so that's that's gonna be uh, very exciting and um, that starts at in about almost ex slightly less than one hour so come back uh, watch watch Astronomical League live uh, the, as always they have door prizes as well and so it's gonna be a lot of fun and then on Sunday yeah uh, if you can make it down here to explore scientific uh, we'll have a warm pizza waiting for you, and we'll have uh, uh, hopefully clear skies with an eclipse going. And even if we don't have clear skies, we've got astrophotographers uh, uh, that are going to be doing live imaging from southern uh, South America all the way up, okay, through uh, Canada. So uh, it should be uh, <laughs> should be good. Uh, Harold Locke says, "Did you see crypto got hacked and is falling?" Uh, I don't even know what to say about crypto, okay? So, uh, thank God I never invested. Anyhow, um, take care, and uh, we'll see you in about 50 minutes, 55 minutes. Take care. <laughs>